Okay, so uh, hi everyone. It's so great to be here three years later. Uh, we're going to start the first session today about uh, high redshift transition and JWST. And we start with Steve. All right. I'm on, I am on. Great. It's wonderful to be back here after a many year gap. And about you, it's my first live conference. So get my sea legs back a little bit. Um, so I'm really excited to talk and show you some early results from uh, JWST. We're going to motivate it with some pre-JWST results. So uh, bear with me while I show you an earlier in 2022 result. Um, the general theme here is pushing towards the beginnings of reanalyzation. I'm actually not going to talk a lot about reanalyzation because we've only had web data for a month. So I can't tell you a whole lot about what that means for reanalyzation. Um, but to go to what I'm really interested in, and I think many of you are as well, is what did starlight first illuminate the universe? There's a beautiful movie playing in the background that you can't see at all, so you have to take my word for it. Uh, but many simulations, including those by many of you, have made predictions for when stars first started to form, whether we're talking about pop three stars, small star clusters, or even galaxies. But we don't actually know until we go and observe it. And so from an observer standpoint, we can motivate this by looking at the evolution of the cosmic star formation rate density. This is a version of a plot that uh, many people have made. This is one that I made a few years back, showing the total amount of star formation per volume as a function of redshift. And uh, you know, when is this plot significantly non-zero? That's kind of another way of asking this. If we can unveil you know, the redshift greater than 10 universe, what does it look like? And if we take a look at what astronomers have done over the past couple of decades, there's a lot of agreement, for the most part, at redshift less than eight. And then when we get to the regime where the Hubble Space Telescope, our fabulous workhorse, is really pushing its limits, you start to see some disagreement here. In particular, does the cosmic star formation rate density continue its smooth evolution that's been pretty well documented from redshift 48 out to redshift 10 and beyond? That might imply lots of early galaxies that we would see with JWST. Or is there an accelerated decline at redshift greater than eight. That might imply, I mean, JWST is wonderful. It could probably work at redshift 10, even 11, but maybe not so many at higher redshifts. And so that's sort of a, a rough prediction for what we should see. So before we jump to JWST, I just wanted to share with you some results that have happened since the last time I was here um, from our group, where we've been trying to sort of do the best we can at redshift nine and 10 with candles, our beloved large uh, HST, I almost said JWST, HST uh, WIFC3 program. And so when candles first happened, we were really focused on redshift six, seven, and eight. It's kind of what candles was built to do. But eventually we, of course, you know, we're waiting and waiting and waiting for web to launch. We wanted to try to work out to redshift 10. And you can do redshift 10 with Hubble, but it's really hard because you only see the galaxies in the reddest filter or maybe the reddest two filters. And so what we did was we combined candles with S candles, candles Spitzer uh, companion survey. Uh, which is 50 hours of exposure with the Spitzer Space Telescope, and found that you can reliably select redshift 9 and 10 galaxies if they're bright enough. Right? They don't actually have to be detected in Spitzer. Um, you non-detection still help, but many of them are. And so uh, there's a big, way too big paper um, that we wrote that was published earlier this year, where we found 11 uh, robust candidate high redshift galaxies. You actually see 14 here. Three of them have X's through them because we spent a long time vetting each of these sources, um, both looking at all the ground-based information we can find and also getting follow-up Hubble imaging and some missing filters. The two in green actually already have spectroscopic confirmations, and we observed a number of the rest of these and confirmed a third one at redshift 8.66. This is a paper uh, by my graduate student, Rebecca Larson. This is a galaxy in the EGS field, which we actually will observe with um, Webb soon. Um, and it's a redshift 8.661. And that's not a coincidence that these redshifts are close together because these two galaxies are actually quite close together. And so you can learn more about that by checking out uh, Rebecca Larson's paper. We think we might be seeing some ionized bubbles happening uh, very early uh, in the universe. So what does this mean about the evolution of the luminosity function? This plot is pretty messy, so I'm just gonna draw a couple lines here. This is basically what you would expect if you had a smoothly evolving luminosity function from redshift four to eight and extrapolated it out to redshift nine to 10. And broadly speaking, this is what observers are seeing. The faint end seems for the most part consistent. There's spread in data. Like I said, there's some disagreement, but the uncertainties are big. So I don't think you can rule this out certainly. And there seem to be more bright redshift nine and 10 galaxies than you would expect, okay? This expected curve is a Schechter function 
One way to solve this is by adopting a double power law form for the galaxy luminosity function, which seems to be favored, although even then, this still seems a little bit higher. So we were wondering, could we actually be seeing something a little bit crazy, which is some early AGN forming in the early universe? That might explain high number densities. It's maybe a little bit strange that you would see this at redshift 9, but who knows how the earliest black holes form. So to take a look at how likely this is, and I should say in our paper, there's like a several explanations for this, and we talk about all of them. Um, AGN is the most exciting one, so that's what I'm going to talk about. So to figure out whether this is likely, we need to understand how the AGN luminosity function evolves. And when we look at luminosity functions, most people think of this part of the luminosity function. This is redshift 4, a lot more data points. It's a little bit better to look at. But this is only part of the story. These are just the star-forming galaxies, or objects where the UV luminosity is dominated by massive stars. But if you go to smaller number densities, as we know, there are objects where the UV luminosity is dominated by supermassive black hole accretion. And when you look at redshift 4, you get the full picture. And that's only been possible relatively recently as, oops, as we've been able to probe sort of the middle region here with modestly deep, very wide area ground-based surveys. You know, we used to have Sloan would find these and like deep fields would find these, but now we've really been able to link these two together. So you, you know, I want to say, great, now we can understand the evolution of the AGN luminosity function. If you're an AGN person, you'd say, we've been doing that for years, and that is true. This is a paper by Giris Kolkarni, who fit AGN luminosity functions across a wide range of redshifts. But the issue is, at the faint end of the AGN luminosity function, that's the bright end of the galaxy luminosity function. If you're fitting an AGN luminosity function, you need to know which objects are AGNs and which objects are galaxies. And so you can do this with color cuts, you can do it with morphological cuts, but when you do that, you're going to introduce some kind of incompleteness. And so our goal here was to avoid placing objects in galaxy bins or in AGN bins and just fit the whole thing together. And this is what it looks like when you do it at redshift 4. We're fitting double power laws to the galaxy component, star forming galaxy component, and a double power law to the AGN component fitting it all together, allowing turnovers at the fainter ends of the luminosity functions, which we can talk about if you want. And it fits pretty well. Great. So let's go do this at all of the redshifts and see if it, you know, see what that says about redshift 9. The problem is, while at redshift 4, we've got tons of bright data here on the AGNs, and even kind of at redshift 5 and a little bit at redshift 6, when we get beyond that, we don't yet have the observations probing the AGN number densities. And we'll have that in the not too distant futures with surveys like Euclid, and the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope High Latitude Survey, but we don't have that yet. So what we did was we fit all redshifts at the same time, and our key assumption is that all of the luminosity function parameters that are shown up here in our double, double power law evolve smoothly with 1 plus z, right? And so, of course, we want to take this and see if it can actually match the data. So everything evolves as a polynomial of 1 plus z. How does it look? It looks like it actually fits very well. And I'm going to you know, hone in on redshift 9 here, because that's where we're focusing on this talk. But it fits all redshifts pretty well. Okay. And so let's come back to the question at hand. So this is now showing the median luminosity function, redshift 3 at the top to redshift 9 at the bottom. And at each point, at each magnitude, it's color-coded by the ratio of AGN to star forming galaxies. So if the line is red, you're AGN dominated. If it's sort of blue, you're galaxy dominated. And the white part is the inflection point. Okay. So are the observed redshift right nine galaxies AGN dominated? All right. Here's the transition from AGN to star forming galaxy dominated that evolves with redshift according to these fits. This is where we observed the redshift right nine galaxy luminosity function. So the answer seems to be no, at least based on these fits. All right. So why are we getting this sort of weird, almost single power law looking luminosity function? All right, number one, and I will try to hit this repeatedly through the talk, most of these galaxies are not spectroscopically confirmed, and they're bright enough, and they probably all will be within the year with JWST. So we can come back and revisit this at that point. Um, but let's say they all hold up. What seems to be happening is that as you go to higher redshift, the faint end slope is steepening. This is something we've known for a while. But the bright end slope of the double power law appears to be shallowing that evolution is a little less significant than the faint end slope. But if you take this luminosity function, you can see the curvature, the bend around M star is sort of less obvious than it was at lower redshift. And throw in some pretty large air bars, and all of a sudden, the whole thing looks like a single power law. So 
The exciting answer of maybe AGEN seems to be no. Again, spectroscopic follow-up not only will confirm the redshift, but will also confirm the ionizing source or study the ionizing source. So we'll have to come back to this at this point. But going back to the evolution of the cosmic star formation rate density, can we learn anything about this sort of era of disagreement here pre-JWST? And I think we can. So this is a figure from our paper focusing just on redshift 9, showing just the redshift 9 luminosity function. The blue shaded region is what we find here. This is a double power law, again, assuming everything evolves smoothly as 1 plus z. So this would be a non-accelerated decline scenario. And it basically matches the data pretty well. There uh, are some data points at the very faint end from lensing that are a little lower. You can't see the air bars on this projector. Don't change the projector. We don't want to screw with that. Um, but they, they're big, right? So, um, you know, obviously we'll learn a lot more about the redshift 9 luminosity function with JWST. But it seems to be, even with HST, there's no reason to think that you can't have a smoothly declining star formation rate density, which sort of bodes well for what we might expect to see with JWST. Okay. So let's move on to that. This is uh, not the real thing. This is a full-scale model. And I'm told that's Austin. Uh, I was there. Austin looks nothing like this. There's like 20 more skyscrapers behind it right now. Uh, we got the full-scale model there in 2013, back when we thought the telescope would launch in 2018. Uh, little did we know at the time, right? So what can we do with JWST? Actually, now, what are we doing, I should say, with JWST? Um, deeper imaging, of course, a bigger mirror is better, but really it's those redder wavelengths that we can access with JWST, which will allow us to actually do real robust work at Redshift 10. Not that we weren't doing robust work before, we were doing the best we could with the data we had, but now we have much better data. And of course, push the higher Redshift. In spectroscopy, which we haven't seen a lot of yet, because not a lot of that has been taken, is going to be the real game changer here. Not only can we find these galaxies, we can actually confirm their Redshifts and study their properties with spectra, which is going to be Amazing. All right, so many of these science goals were the motivation behind our now in progress early release science program, SEERS, and many folks in the room are part of SEERS. Um, very active <laughs> collaboration right now uh, with many, many, many emails every day, many Slack messages every day. It's been really exciting. SEERS was approved in August of 2017, and we got our first data in July of 2022. So it's been a long wait, but it appears that it was well worth it. So the key science goals of SEERS, science goal number one, really motivating the survey layout, was to really nail the Redshift 10 universe by studying the evolution of the luminosity function. So we had some predictions for the number of galaxies in SEERS that we would expect for basically a smoothly evolving luminosity function here. This is just one model by Peter Baruzzi that sort of mimics that. We should find galaxies out to Redshift 12, maybe even beyond. If the universe is more pessimistic and there really is something like an accelerated decline, we really shouldn't push past redshift 11. Either way, we can study redshift 10. That was our safety net. But that sort of gives us uh, a simple uh, goal to sort of learn from. And then, of course, we're doing much more. We're doing spectra. We haven't done it yet. That will come in December, as I'll show you. We'll be able to study the chemical compositions of galaxies through strong emission lines. We'll be able to confirm redshifts. We'll be able to study the ionizing properties. And then there will be much, much, much work about morphological analysis with a great resolution. I'll show you some real images in a second and also studying AGNs at both low and high redshift. So here is the SEERS observing plan. This is now the final version. We've had many different versions, but we're now locked in because we've taken data. It's kind of messy, so I'll walk you through it. Number one, this is in the EGS field. The EGS field is actually where seven of those 11 redshift 9 to 10 candidates I showed you before lied. We didn't know that when we chose the, the field. We actually chose the field for two reasons. Uh, the GTO teams had already taken the goods fields, and out of the remaining candles fields, we could line up parallel modes of JWST the best in this field. And that's really what Sears is demonstrating, efficient parallel mode surveys with JWST, two instruments at a time. So what have we already done? At the very end of June, we took four near cam pointings here, outlined in green, number one, two, three, and six. I can explain the numbering later. At the same time, we have four MIRI pointings in parallel. In near cam, we're doing imaging in five to six filters, depending on the field, spanning roughly one to five microns. With MIRI, in these two fields here, which um, uh, overlap with the near cam imaging, we're going fairly deep in the two bluest MIRI bands, 5.6 and 7.7 .7 microns. And these two filters over here, we're going less deep in almost all of the MIRI bands, going from seven microns to 21 microns. So those latter two, we call the MIRI red fields, and that's really about dust emission from star-forming galaxies and AGNs at lower redshift. These two here, these are our MIRI blue fields. Those are really about pinning down uh, rest frame optical emission at higher redshift. 
Come December, at some point between December 15th and December 28th, when EGS comes back out from behind the sun, which is where it is right now, we'll do the remainder of our program. We will do six more near cam pointings down here. And at the same time, we will do near spec over six pointings. For the most part, the near spec slits, and there'll be about a thousand of them, are on sources already known with Hubble. There are some small overlaps with some of the data we've gotten, and we will see if we can get some interesting sources in there. Um, I, it was technically not allowed at the time of ERS submission, but I think they will probably let us. We'll see. Um, and that's to do you know, pretty much anything you, you would want to do with one to five micron spectroscopy, like I mentioned, chemical composition, ionization, redshifts, of course. We're doing R of 1,000 in all three gradings and six pointings, and the R of 100 prism in four pointings. And then also at that same time, we will do four pointings with the near cam slitless grism spectrograph with one filter, the F356 filter, that will get three to four micron spectroscopy for everything in the field at R1500. It's very different from the Hubble WIFC3 grism that you're used to at very low resolution. This is fairly high resolution. And also we will be able to get mirror parallels with those. And so those will sit right over here. This was functionally to test uh, slit losses because we will have emission lines that we see in the grism that we'll also get with the near spec slits. But we're, of course, really excited for serendipitous emission line detection. And there's already been one near cam grism uh, serendipitous redshift 6.103 emission line detected and a calibration pointing. They were observing a star, and they just saw an emission line peeking out elsewhere in the field. So that'll be exciting. Um, we have simulated data on our website. I'm not going to talk much about it because I want to show you the real data. But if you want to learn how to reduce and analyze JWST data, please go to our website, sears.github.io. We have simulated data in all of our modes, near cam imaging and Prism, MIRI and near spec, and data reduction uh, Python notebooks showing you how to reduce it. Um, we will deliver reduced data and catalogs rapidly. Our data releases of sort of best effort imaging will be three months after data acquisition, so September for what we have now, and eight months after we'll have a more final version with the catalog. But let's look at the real imaging. This is not impressive, but if you come to my computer later, I'll show you, or go to our website. Uh, this is um, an image that SDSEI helped put together. They pulled Zolt LeVay out of retirement uh, to help make this image, which we really appreciate. And, uh, yeah, I almost just want to move past it because it looks so, so good on a better, a better image. But it's stunning, especially if you can, uh, if you can zoom in. Um, this is an image of one of our MIRI pointings. Here we have four, four MIRI pointings again. And here, this looks a little better. We just pulled out some of the really exciting sources showing the level of detail. And we actually put this up on, we have this huge like 50 foot vis wall at UT. And we just spent like half an hour walking back and forth and looking. And of course, we want to find the high redshift galaxies and learn about them, but the low redshift galaxies are really stunning. And if you spent some time looking at any of the JWST images, the increase in resolution over Hubble is amazing. The number of star clusters you can see is actually a supernova that somebody discovered within a couple days uh, of these data coming out. Interacting galaxies is really amazing. This is another way of comparing uh, HST to JWST. This is something we put together for our Twitter account. This is a real Redshift 9 galaxy seen in HST. It was one of those bright, call it a bright Redshift 9 galaxy. This is like a couple of hours with Hubble with C3. And you could just barely see it in Spitzer Iraq at about 50 hours. This is how this same galaxy looks in Sears in about 40 minutes of integration, right? It's way too bright, of course. Bright enough to see with Hubble. So of course it's going to look bright. But this is pretty, pretty amazing. So now you want to know what are we actually finding. So how do we do this? We find high redshift galaxies via photometric redshift selection. So sort of what can we do with the filter set? This is the Sears filter set here, going from blue to uh, red here. This is where the Lyman alpha break would be, a redshift of 10 to 15. And so at a redshift of 10, you should basically see no flux in the F115W filter. That's our bluest filter. If you can get out to redshift 13 or higher, you should also see no flux in the F150W filter, OK? So I'm going to show you some images, and that's kind of what you're looking for. Do we or do we not see flux in those bluest bands? Really, you're looking for something where you don't see flux here, and then it looks fairly blue over here, right? If you don't see flux there and it looks red over here, it could just be a red low redshift galaxy where you're not going faint enough to see it. That's basically the name of the game. OK, so our goal within Sears, we knew there was going to be a glut of papers downloading data trying to get the first high redshift results out. We didn't really want to be in that game. We really wanted to get a full understanding of the data. It's a brand new observatory, all kinds of issues. Still yet, some of the calibrations we have are from the ground. There are no in-flight flat fields, as far as I understand, uh, in the pipeline. So that was still the plan. 
But with each successive version of our near cam reduction, and we were making significant pr improvements, sort of we locked ourselves in a conference room the week of July 18th to do this, one object kept appearing every single time. So this was the first time we saw this object on July 18th. Looks a little dirty, but it looks to be a dropout in the two bluest bands. That was my birthday, so this was nice. A couple days later, we had an improved reduction. It's a little bit cleaner, still stood out. And a couple days later, my daughter's birthday, which will become important in a minute, it looks even better. Actually, looks, now this looks dirtier on the screen than in, in, in real life, but you'll take my word for it. It doesn't look like there's flux here, and there's a pretty bright, obvious source here. And so eventually, we became convinced uh, that it was real, and that even with improved versions of the data reduction, we weren't going to decide it was a brown dwarf or a low of galaxy. So we decided to write up a paper, and the galaxy ended up getting named after my daughter, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, here is the photometric redshift distribution. Uh, I use easy, which is the purple line, but we wanted to try to be really careful, so we had a number of folks in the team, including Kartik here in the room, run their own codes on it, and everybody broadly agreed that it was redshift 12 or greater with sort of an average peak at 13 to 14. And so we wrote up this paper, which we submitted to Archive a few weeks ago, and here, and now you can see it much better here, appears to be a dropout. This is actually a stack of the ACS bands. This is a combined version of the two bluest bands, and then you can see it very nicely here. Um, why do we name it after my daughter? Uh, it was not my idea originally. I kind of jokingly did it. We originally called it uh, Sears Z14-1, and I was really worried that with more data and better time, we would decide it was at like redshift 12 or 13 and not 14. And so then we named it like J14 something, 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 something. And we didn't like having that throughout the paper. And then, you know, we said, well, we found out my daughter's birthday, so we named it after her. And, you know, you can be mad at me if we want to, but that's okay. Uh, and she got to be on the news, the local news in Austin, so she liked that. All right, so is this galaxy really at redshift greater than 10? Okay, uh, I'm still fairly convinced the answer is yes, but we will not know until we get a spectrum, right? We're probing these really exceptional early times in the universe. We need a spectroscopic redshift to know for sure, not just for our galaxy, but for all the very high redshift galaxies you're seeing. And this is possible with the power of JWST. So we've already put in a DDT proposal. Sears wrote the proposal. We combined forces with the Edinburgh team. Fortunately, our galaxy and the uh, Callum Don and Redshift 17 candidate are within one near spec MSA pointing. And so we'll cover both of those. Still pending. We don't know if that's going to happen. Hopefully it will. Although even if it's approved, uh, like I said, EGS is behind the sun. So we won't get the data till December. We did observe it for 90 minutes with Keck plus Nyres during some engineering time and didn't see anything. Um, the only way we would have seen a, a significant signal is if there was a low redshift extreme emission line galaxy solution, which was not unlikely, but not impossible. And so now at least we can, we can rule that out, which is nice. Uh, before we submitted the paper, we checked all available multi-wavelength data from Spitzer, from Herschel, from JCMT, from VLA, and found no detections, which also reduces the likelihood of a low redshift, dusty, star-forming galaxy solution. So everything seems likely that it's redshift greater than 7, if not greater than 10. What about HST? I showed you before, we don't see it in ACS. Right before we submitted it, we checked the WIFC3 imaging, and I was a little bit surprised to see something in F160W. It's a weird morphology, it's kind of noisy, but it's about a three sigma significance detection. And I was surprised because we didn't see it in F150, and those band passes are similar, except F160 extends a little bit redder than F150. And so if we included this, it could indicate a redshift of about 12 to 13, although because the low significance, the photo Z still preferred 14, so we discussed this in the original version of the paper. Okay. Post-submission of the paper, we're still every day uh, improving our reduction of the data, and the majority of our time has been on the astrometry, which has been a real challenge. If you download data from MASS, which goes through the default pipeline and make a color image, it looks like this. It looks like you need 3D glasses to actually see what's going on. And that's because the pipeline is not aligning the image as well. And I'm sure it will eventually get there, but it means if you want to do science, you need to do it yourself. But we knew that, and we had worked on it, and we thought that at the time, we were aligned to within about a pixel, a 0.03 arc second pixel, and we thought that was good enough, okay? But we've kept working at it. This is heroic efforts from Michaela Bagley, who's a postdoc at UT, with lots of help from Anton Kokomor, and we have significantly improved that, whereas at the end of last week, we have no offsets from filter to filter or filter to HST, and the scatter is also significantly reduced. This affects our short wavelength camera images more and has resulted in a shift in the F150W image relative to the redder wavelengths of one to two pixels, depending on where your source is, as well as better alignment between individual exposures. You can imagine if you had real flux, 
We have many exposures being stacked, and if they're not quite aligned, you're going to wash that flux out. And so, long story short, we think this is what happened because in our better version of the reduction, we have a very weak positive signal in F150W, where we didn't before. Okay, this is our old data on the top. Galaxies should be there in the middle, don't see anything. Here's our new data there on the bottom. Not booming, right? But you can see more white pixels than you saw before. It's a little bit easier to see if you smooth it. Here, here's the old version, here's the new version. This is probably that signal there, and now we're better aligned on it here. So what does that actually mean? It does not mean, fortunately, the galaxy is at redshift five. It means it's much more likely to be at a redshift of 12 rather than a redshift of 14. So these are updated uh, photo Z results here. Peaks very nicely at redshift 12. Still no low Z solution at all. The red line is if you force a low Z solution just to see what it's like. And here's what the photometry looks like here. And now the very weak F150 detection with JBST really makes sense, the HST 160 detection. We're just probing the very, very edge of the Lyman alpha break. So what can we actually learn from this galaxy now that we know it's at a redshift of 12 and not 14? Well, I shouldn't say no. We think, we'll hopefully know once we get a spectrum. Um, so we've done SED fitting with a number of different stellar population codes, including by Kartik and Mark here in the room. And this is the stellar mass of the object, about 10 to the 8.5. So modestly massive for redshift 12. Does not appear to be very dusty, which is not surprising. And has a fairly high star formation rate for its mass, or high specific star formation rate. What do we expect to have seen this galaxy in Sears, right? That was kind of coming back to the initial question. We should have expected to see maybe a few if the cosmic star formation rate continued its accelerated decline, or sorry, its smooth decline. Most models do not predict that. Most models predict an accelerated decline. So it shouldn't come as a surprise when we compare the number of galaxies from a number of different simulations to what we see. Here's our line of one. There's an air shading on here. You can't see. It looks like this, right? The only one that roughly matches it is that Bruzian silk model, which was that fairly shallow blue line on the plot I showed you earlier. If we look at the luminosity function, there's some lines here you can't see, but I'll draw them with my hand. Here's our data point here. If you were to draw a smoothly evolving either Schechter or double power law luminosity function, they kind of go right down here. So it's actually maybe a little bit high, but fully consistent with smoothly evolving and not consistent with an accelerated decline here. So early signs point to a redshift greater than 10 universe with significant star formation. We're going, to keep, uh, we're going to keep a running list of all of our papers on our website. I know we're out of time, so I won't see too much more. Uh, we have one other one by Jorge Zavala looking at another galaxy that you might have thought was at very high redshift based on its photo Z. But if you look with Noema at 1.1 millimeters, there's a nice detection there. So it's really actually at redshift 5. Uh, and we'll skip this. Will Sears find the first galaxies? No, but there are deep field programs, including our NG Deep survey, which is a very deep nearest <coughs> spectroscopic exposure on the UDF, along with ultra deep near cam imaging in parallel. Similar depth to the GTO, deepest part of the GTO uh, Jade's deep field, um, but will be public immediately. And so that will come in January. All right, and I will leave up my conclusions here. Thank you. Do you have questions? Please wait for the mic because of uh, recording. Hi. Uh, very nice talk. And I have a question about the first part and, uh, and this last part you are talking now about. Um, when you compare uh, the data with the predictions by the Schechter function, you are using an IMF that is the one of the local universe. But at this very high redshift, the universe will be quite different. The star forming complexes will be more massive and probably we'll have more massive stars in relation with the low mass stars than in the local universe. Mm -hmm. Have you tried to, to leave the, the, the slope of the high mass end of the IMF as a free parameter and try to see if you can fit the observations just by changing the, the IMF sh uh, shape? No. <laughs> this is a simple answer. It's a good question. I think. That would be something really interesting to explore uh, when doing SED fitting, trying to actually understand the properties of these galaxies. I guess, I'm trying to think of how that would impact the luminosity function, because I guess that would change essentially the mass to light ratio, but we're, all we're looking at is the distribution of the UV light. And so if the IMF changed with redshift, then that would change the evolution of the luminosity function with redshift in some way, but that might be hard to disentangle with the evolution we're seeing just to you know, evolution of structure formation in the universe as well. All right, um, so thanks for the talk. Um, I just 
have one question, and I was wondering if when we are measuring such high redshift galaxy masses, especially masses, um, should, are we supposed to worry about any uh, potential contaminants from supernovae or other things like AGN? That's a good question. AGN, if you take the first half of the talk seriously, I would say no, seems to be unlikely. Supernovae, um, there has to be some kind of sort of time probability argument to how likely uh, you would be to see one in the galaxy. Right. Um, the, the only thing I could think of is that some of these deeper surveys are going to have multiple repeated exposures over days or weeks or even months. If, if there was some, something happening in the universe where supernovae were much more frequent in early times, uh, you would see some signal, I think, in that. But yeah. I don't know. I have to think about it a little more. All right. Thanks. Right. One last question, and I suggest the next speaker on setup. Yes, I have a question about the beta parameter, the UV slope mm -hmm. and the rest frame UV. Is it, can you estimate that parameter? Is it very high? Yeah. Uh, so in the original version, it was minus 2.3. So it was not exceptional, sort of consistent with not much dust. I have not been able to do it with the new photometry. It does look like it's going to be a little bit bluer, but I don't think it's going to be min minus 3 or anything uh -huh. crazy like that. Yes. I'm not crazy, but maybe expect it at some point. Uh, but for such a massive galaxy, I don't think we would expect it. Um, the interesting thing is, in a paper uh, that Sandra Takella and I wrote uh, earlier in the year, we looked at the redshift 10 galaxies, the beta slopes, and they were not all that blue. They were like minus 2, which wasn't too inconsistent with massive galaxies at lower redshift. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it sort of hints to very efficient early dust formation. At some point, that's got to break. Um, we need more massive galaxies at redshift 12 if, we, if they exist to actually study that. Mm -hmm.